channel. So thank you again for all of you joining us tonight. I'm so excited to welcome Elizabeth Gilbert here. She's one of the best known, most beloved writers working today. She's been named one of the most influential, 100 influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Her books have been translated into over 46 languages. Some of you might be familiar with her little known memoir, Eat, Pray, Love, uh, which is one of the best selling and most influential nonfiction books of all time. But she's also an incredibly accomplished novelist, and I absolutely love her novels. Her last one, The Signature of All Things, was long listed for the Bailey's Women's Prize in Britain and shortlisted for the Welcome Prize. And we are talking today about her new novel, City of Girls, which is already a New York Times bestseller, of course. Elizabeth is joining us today from her home. Where are you joining us from, actually, Liz? I am in the middle of rural New Jersey, oh, and I, I own an old church here. Oh, about amazing. About 15 years ago that I bought on Craigslist <laughs> I was, when I was in Laos. I was in the South Pacific, or I was in Southeast Asia looking for a home, and I saw it on Craigslist, and I bought it without seeing it because of these windows. Look at these windows. Oh, it's heaven. It's a little box of light. It's this tiny little perfect old 18th century chapel. And um, oh, this is perfect. where I'm doing my my quarantine. It's not so bad. <laughs> very monastic. You're self-isolating in an old church. I love it. It's a proper religious experience. Do it right. <laughs> <laughs> so how has it been for you? Let's talk about the current situation first. How are you finding this all? I mean, I think there's two levels of it for me. There's the 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 global, my feelings as a global citizen and a, as a human being, and there's my feelings of my personal experience of it. So my feelings as a global citizen and a human being are um, that this is devastating and terrifying and heartbreaking, um, the amount of suffering that people are going through, not just physically, but economically. It's, it's a nightmare. Um, mm. And it's also inspiring to see people keep referring to this as a war. I think that war is the, the analogy that comes up the most often. And yet we have to also remember that it's ex exactly the opposite of a war mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in a war, people are desperately trying to kill one another. Yeah. And in this situation, literally the entire world is trying to save itself and each other. And um, so, but it's still devastating. But on a personal level, I'm fine. I'm, I'm the one person who you don't need to worry about. I like my own company. I right. love place where I am. I have mm -hmm. had maybe two interactions with human beings outside of myself in the last five weeks. Um, but I've been kind of preparing for this my whole life because right. I've spent <laughs> so much time alone writing or alone in, in meditation retreats. So I'm, I'm, I'm made this decision that I'm not going to waste it. And I don't mean by being creative or productive. I mean, by being really curious about what it's like to be totally alone for months on end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to say, is this the natural state for a writer anyway? Self-isolated. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not that different. Um, and and so I'm okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I'm much more concerned about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you miss, though, about the outside world? Um, is it terrible that it's taking me so long to answer that question? <laughs> Look, I miss New York. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker and I miss mm. my city. My city is closed and my city is hurting. And um, I, I drove back in for one day a couple weeks ago to pick up some things and, and it's spooky. It's very, very spooky to be in the East Village walking down St. Mark Street and being the only person on the street. And yeah. it's, 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 it's it's extremely surreal, but I think all of you know that feeling from where it, wherever it is that you may be. But yeah, I miss I miss my city. <laughs> uh, Liz, you know, a lot of people turn to you for life advice, and I, in particular, revere your book Big Magic, which is just the most brilliant tips on writing. So I wondered if, in this period, you know, as you say, you've been preparing for this your whole life in terms of meditation retreats and writing. I wondered if you had advice for people out there who are kind of struggling with this, being on their own all day and don't know what to do and feel like they should be productive but they can't focus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I kind of have two light layers of advice, and the first one is. If there's anything that I could want for you all, it's that you show yourselves mercy. Um, so that is so much more important than anything that you create or anything that you do or anything that you accomplish or don't accomplish. Um, we're, we live in such a merciless culture and it's a merciless time of, of, of the world's history for humanity. The expectations that we put on ourselves are enormous and unfair and inhumane and cruel. And a lot of you are stuck at home with children. <laughs> a lot of you are sick yourselves. A lot of you are sick and stuck at home with children. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of you are in less than ideal living situations. A lot of you are struggling with work situations. So, so before anything, like before any 
goals or aspirations about this. I think we just have to lay down a carpet of the softest mercy that this is not what anybody asked for and it's hard. Um, and, and if you don't do anything but survive this, you did well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, great. Like that's <laughs> awesome. Um, that's the only thing you have to do is to get through this. Um, if you want to take it to another level and you want to see this as a strange cosmic invitation to feel uncomfortable feelings and um, to to feel what isolation and loneliness actually are like um, in order to know yourself better and also to know humanity better and to be more kind uh, and understanding to people when they are in isolation and loneliness in the future to really recognize what it feels like to be housebound and to mm. let that grow, grow your compassion. Um, you know, that's a good use of the time. Mm. Um, and, and, but I, I honestly think if, if the only thing you could use this time for is to show compassion to yourself every time that you feel like you're failing, that you're not doing it right, that you should be getting six pack rock hard stomach abs at the same time as writing your first novel at the same time as <laughs> Marie Kondo in your home, you know, like none of that is required. None of that is expected. I love you anyway. Just survival is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about City of Girls, which is a, pro it's a perfect book for self-isolation. It is a proper big novel that you can get stuck into. And it is such an enthralling book. There's so many strands in it. I thought I'd actually hand this over to you, Liz, to describe as the writer. You can, you can definitely describe it better than me. Okay, thank you. Although you were doing a, you were doing a great job. I was enjoying that. Um, <laughs> so City of Girls is a novel that's set mostly in, in the 1940s in New York City at a time of actual war, um, a time where the entire world was at war and most of New York had emptied out of nearly all of its men, sent them all overseas to fight. And it was really girls and women who were left to run New York City. It's the story of a young girl who moves to New York at the age of 19, and she goes to live with her Aunt Peg, a fantastic, eccentric, wonderful, loving bohemian who has a theater company in Midtown Manhattan, a kind of shabby, down-on-its-luck theater company um, that puts on cheap entertainments for working-class people. And uh, Vivian, who is our heroine, is has been raised in a very cloistered, respectable um, Anglo-Saxon family of private schools and and um, privilege, and she's thrown into this world of showgirls and dancers and actors and playboys and glamour and a lot of sex and a lot of wildness, and she takes to it like a duck to water. <laughs> and um, so the book is, and the book is told from her point of view in her 90s, looking back upon that time. And the book is told as a letter that she's writing to a woman she has just gotten a letter from saying, now that my mother is dead, I wonder if you might be able to tell me what you were to my father. So the entire book is an answer that she's giving to this person, this stranger. Um, and we don't know who the father is and we don't know what the relationship is. And so it's a little bit of a mystery, but, um, but mostly it's about an older woman looking back on her wild youth with um, a great deal of fondness for her younger self. <laughs> now, there is so much going on in this, it feels, uh, sort of like just, you know, picking out one bit of Satsuma from the Horn of Plenty. But to pick out one relationship in this that really grabbed me, um, it's the relationship between Peg, who's Vivian's older aunt, she's probably about in her 40s, I'm guessing, and this woman who also works in the theater, Olive, who's like her assistant. Um, and they have this very interesting relationship. At first, we just see it as them working together in theater. And then one night, Vivian sees them dancing together, and they're obviously in love. And and it feels like the one uncomplicated relationship in the book, mm -hmm. even though it's hidden. And I wondered if you see them as tragic or triumphant. Triumphant, completely. Mm -hmm. um, triumphant for so many reasons, because that's, um, there's a line in the book where Vivian says, I never really witnessed a real marriage. And my sister wrote in the margins, yes, she did. In the original <laughs> draft, she goes, yes, she did. She saw Olive and Peg. Um, you know, that they just belonged to each other in a way that was very simple. They were not similar. Um, Peg is very bohemian, very wild, very devil may care, very like a spendthrift, a drinker. Um, and Olive is straight laced, a school marm, um, by the book, by the rules. But, but we also discover midway through the book, the incredible loyal heart that Olive mm -hmm. has and the way that she will go to the defense of anybody, any of her people who are in trouble. And you, you really can see 
why you could love that woman. Um, so no, I see it as a triumph and, and not just for that reason, but also because Olive won the prize. I mean, Peg is the one who everybody in the world loves and including her incredibly handsome playboy husband. Right. Um, and, and Olive somehow with her stodgy boxy suits and her mothball smell and her sensible <laughs> shoes manages to win Peg away from the handsomest man in Hollywood. So, uh, so yeah, I would say, and they get to spend their whole life together. So yeah, it's definitely a triumph. <laughs> so, I mean, you can really tell that you have this total love for that period, the 1940s New York theater world. And I love how the book itself feels like a movie from the 1940s. There's screwball moments, there's war moments, there's this tragic love moments. And I wondered, you know, reading it, I kept picturing specific actors from the 1940s in the roles, you know, Billy, Tyrone Power, you know, uh -huh. someone else, Catherine Hepburn. And I wondered if, if either, first of all, if there were specific references from the 40s that you had in mind writing it, and if you had specific people for the characters. I love that you were seeing that. Um, somewhat, uh, there's, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. There was a stage actress who, I can't believe I'm, I'm not being able to remember her name right now. I could, if you'll give me one second, you, we can come back to that. Okay. No problem. All right, we can come back to it anyway. Anyway, there's, like, there's a book right over there. There's a book right over there where I can get the answer. Anyway, um, you guys will have to bear with me. But there was there was one stage actress from the 1940s who I modeled um, the great uh, leading lady in the in the book, um, the 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 actress character who comes from mm -hmm. England and who is the star of the show, um, and I modeled her on on that character. Um, that's the only person who was somewhat real. Um, mostly everybody is an amalgam of people I know. Um, my Aunt Peg is very similar to, to my Aunt Lolly, who's right. 98 yeah. years old now and um, was um, probably a closeted lesbian for most of her life. You know, we just didn't, like, it's never been discussed, but everybody kind of knows. Um, and, uh, you know, various other characters are inspired by, um, I think Billy, who's the playboy husband of Aunt Peg, I kind of saw him as, George Clooney being like, yep. if, if, George, if, he were to, if he were to be played <laughs> by anybody, he would have to be played by George Clooney because he'd have to be played by somebody who is so bad, but you can't help but love them anyway. <laughs> because they're so charming. Um, so yeah, but, but mostly I would say it was just reading a lot of biographies from the day and studying mm. a lot of um, theater history and then just kind of making a mishmash of everything. Now tell me if I'm wrong, of course, but it seemed to me when I was reading it that these specific sentences were kind of the crux of the book. Vivian writes this in the letter to the younger woman. She says, at some point, a woman just gets tired of being ashamed all the time. After that, she is free to become who she really is. Now you've written a lot about letting go of fear in terms of how to live your life and embrace creativity. And I wondered when you were able to let go of shame, because that's a slightly different thing. Well, that, I love that you think I've let go of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's what I'm telegraphing. I mean, I'm, I'm much, much kinder to myself at 50 than I've ever been to myself in my entire life. And me and Liz can now, I can now say that she and I have a, a pretty solid friendship. You know, mm. um, I, I'm a, I've become a good steward of her. And, and as a good steward, I make sure that, um, I make sure that, terrorists are not allowed in the room uh, to attack her, even if they're in here, you know, mostly, um, mostly, but, but look, I'm, I'm human and I'm vulnerable. And when I feel like I have failed my exceedingly high expectations that I hold for myself, um, I, I suffer, um, I, but only always, <laughs> only always. And, um, and, and, it's it's been a lifetime. I was raised by people who set very high standards for themselves and who set very high standards for me, um, and who were very unforgiving of themselves. They were very kind people to others, but not to themselves. And I think mm -hmm. that's where we pick that up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we learn that from our from our families. I, how often have you ever met somebody who's really kind to themselves? It's a rare thing to find in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so where would we have learned it? You know, like you have to, I mean, part of the, the the journey of shame for me has just been forgiving myself for the fact that this was never modeled to me, you know? And yeah. so I had to sort it out on my own. And, and, and essentially the way I've had to sort it out is to say that um, this is the, the model that I go back to again and again, that um, all of us people who call ourselves good people or who want to be good people, um, we have an aspiration that we want to practice universal human compassion. You know, I don't, I don't know anybody, I'm not close with anybody who doesn't want that, who doesn't mm. want to become somebody who 
who can practice universal patience and forgiveness and empathy and compassion to the world. So here's what I figured out a long time ago, because I'm a genius, <laughs> figured out that universal compassion that doesn't include compassion toward the self is not universal. Mm. It's a major block. It there's a major hole in that, and and you have to actually fold yourself into the universe, and say that if I'm going to practice universal love and human compassion, that starts at home, and that starts with this. That starts with anybody who's suffering. And right now, the person who's suffering is me because I'm ashamed of myself and I'm beating myself up and I'm being unkind to myself. And that's the first person who I need to show some compassion to right now. Otherwise, if you take yourself out of that equation, there's a narcissism to it, actually, mm. um, that suggests that you think that you're a special case. Um, <laughs> that, you know, everyone else in the world, everyone else in the world is entitled to love and forgiveness and mercy except you, right? So what, like one of the things that can break me down out of my shame is when I ask myself, what makes you so, what makes you think you're so special that you're not entitled to mercy and everybody else is? You're no different mm -hmm. from anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so the narcissism of shame is something that, that, that once I figured mm -hmm. out that I was doing that, it took it away a little bit. <laughs> it suddenly didn't yeah, seem so yeah. numerous. <laughs> I mean, you have that, you have that um, bit in, um, oh gosh, I remember you talking about this ages ago when I went to see one of your talks when it was about big magic and you talk about that feeling that a lot of people have, creative people, when they get stuck, you think everyone's watching you. And you have yeah. to realize no one's watching you. Yeah, you need to not. get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. Nobody's looking at your shoes. Nobody yeah. cares. You know, it's just not that big a deal. And that's that is so much more devastating than thinking that everybody's looking at you and judging you. Right? It's like, what do you mean nobody's looking at me? It's that's yeah. the worst. <laughs> that's, that's the that is the that is the biggest ego blow, but also in a weird way, the beginning of liberation. <laughs> now, not very long ago, Liz, over the past few years, you've had to make some very public personal announcements. First, that your marriage was over, that you've fallen in love with your best friend, and then that she extremely sadly passed away. And making any of those announcements on such a big stage would take an enormous amount of courage. I think all of us here now are wondering if we would have that courage to make those announcements to the world. And I wondered if making going through that process helped you let go of some of the fear or shame that you might have still had um i'll tell you something uh, very honestly i didn't do that for anybody else but myself mm -hmm. um i didn't make those announcements because i felt that i owed information to mm -hmm. the world or to my readers um i made those announcements because it made my life easier um, and and there's a there's a really wonderful adage for making decisions about your life, which goes like this: How would this look if it was easy? <laughs> How would this look if it was easy? So the easiest thing is to be transparent. Um, it's just easier. It's just easier because then you're not keeping various storylines straight, mm. and you're trying to keep secrets, which is exhausting, and um, you're not looking over your shoulder to see what people are thinking about you or who knows what, or who's going to reveal what the simplest thing for me, given the fact that I'm somewhat of a public figure. I mean, I'm not a Kardashian, but like, <laughs> you know, thank God, you know, but people, but you know, people sometimes recognize me on the street. Like I wanted to be able to walk down the street when Rhea was, I only had a very short amount of time with her. Mm -hmm. And, and when I found out that she was sick and that she had terminal pancreatic and liver cancer, they said she only had six months to live. So these were decisions that had to be made very quickly. Um, my decision to leave my marriage and to go be with her for that short amount of time meant that every single one of those moments mattered to me enormously. And I just wanted to be like, hey, everybody, <laughs> like literally everybody, family, friends, fans, strangers, the news. Um, I just want to let you know, this is happening. I'm taking no questions about it. Mm -hmm. um, as you were, off I go, you know, and, and that actually just, it just made me free to be able to then instantly turn my attention back to being with her and know that I could walk into a restaurant holding her hand. Too bad, everybody, look, I told you, she's my, you know, we're together. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, and I also, um, so, so yeah, it was to make my life easier. And there was also an element of pride in how much I loved Rhea and how much, how proud I was of the way that we loved each other. And there was an element of wanting to share that sense, you know, yeah. um, like, 
I had loved her for so long, so quietly, and I was finally able to be like, look, <laughs> you know, I'd always been putting the spotlight on her because she was so extraordinary. And I, I was delighted to be able to, to put it on her even more. Um, and uh, yeah, but mostly it was just so that I could go about my life and not be wondering whose stories I needed to keep straight. Yeah, yeah. Now, Liz, you know how big a fan I am of your previous novel, The Signature of All Things. And like City of Girls, first of all, an excellent lockdown novel. If any of you haven't read it yet, it is so, it's huge and it's so engrossing and you learn so much from it, just like this one. And it strikes me that although you're known for your very personal nonfiction writing and your, you know, the beautiful way you talk about yourself and the, how people go through emotions, your fiction tends to be about people living lives in times and in, in occasionally places, not necessarily this one, but times certainly far removed from ours. They are historical novels. And I wondered if that was deliberate, if there was a separation between the sort of personal nonfiction and the very different faraway fiction. Yeah, it is. I mean, I also try to write the novels that I would like to read. Um, mm. And I always imagine that when I'm creating a novel, I try to think, what is the novel where if I heard about it, I would be like, oh, I totally want to read that, you know? And and that was how I felt with Signature of All Things, because I was so into plants and botany at that time. And, and I remember thinking, if I heard that there was a novel about a 19th century woman who co-discovered evolution with Charles Darwin and traveled all over the world and learned... Um, everything about the evolution of, of, of species on earth through studying moss. I would want to read that. I would want to read that. And if I heard that there was a novel about um, New York City in the 1940s in the theater world, I would want to read that. So part of it is just me wanting to go and play in the worlds that I think are really interesting. The other thing is that um, if you really want to know about me, read The Signature of All Things and City of Girls. Alma mm -hmm. Whitaker, the character in the, in the Signature of All Things, and Vivian Morris in City of Girls will tell you more about what I'm like than anything that I could ever write about myself in memoir. Mm -hmm. You'll learn more about me through that. That is, There's something about being able to hide in a novel all the elements of my life that I feel like I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable about talking openly. I can put them in there, disguise them, massage them around a little bit, play with them, turn them into something else, and I can use them for for grist for stories without feeling too revealed. So um so yeah, they've I've heard it said that every novel is a every novel is a memoir and mm. every and every memoir is a work of fiction. <laughs> so yeah. definitely I feel like the truer the truest my emotional life laid bare are in those books. I've got to tell you Liz that when I was reading City of Girls there was so much of Vivian I could really relate to. And there's a scene in it, I don't want to give it away for anyone who hasn't had the joy of reading it yet, but Vivian does something bad. Well, sort of something that hurts other people in the book. Yeah. I don't want to say she bad. Does some, just she does something but, bad. <laughs> yeah, she does something bad. And as we all do at times. As yeah. we all do. And the main, the leading lady in it, uh, Edna, who's like the main actress in the theater where they're working, confronts her about it afterwards. And there's this scene, this speech. It honestly felt like it pierced my heart. So oh, my I, I'm not, I'm not going to quote it, but there's, well, I will quote. I'm not going to, I'll paraphrase it. When Edna says to Vivian, Vivian's 19, Edna's probably in her late 30s. And she says to Vivian, you are not an interesting person. You are laboring under that misapprehension and you will never be an interesting person. An interesting and, person. and I mean, it sends chills down me. Yeah. It. And, you know, I didn't do anything quite like what Vivian did, but I definitely made mistakes when I was 19, my 20s, still yeah. making them now, I'm sure. And if someone said that to me, it would devastate me. And I wondered what it was like reading that speech. Because like you say, there is parts of you in Vivian. What is it like, you know, uh, having her so taken down like that? Oh, it's so brutal. <laughs> it was so brutal. I mean, I and I needed Vivian to be destroyed, you know, yeah. and I needed her to be destroyed by somebody who she really, really loved and respected. Yeah. Um, and and I think uh, a friend of mine once said that you, you're not really an adult until you have been broken hearted and until you have broken somebody else's heart. Um, that, that both of those things are required in order for you to have the humility to step into adulthood, right? Mm. And that's a moment where, so Vivian's got beauty and she's got she's a certain amount of charm and she's been rich her whole life and like nothing has ever mattered. Um, you know, no one, and, and she's also been kind of neglected. Nobody's ever been really paying much attention to her. So she's been allowed to run wild and she's been running wild and, and there's never been a consequence. Um, and, and until you hit that wall of consequence, 
in your life, you're just going to keep careening around doing what you want and hurting people. Um, and, and consequence has to be felt and it has to be felt at a, at a really deep level for change to come. Um, so yeah, I, I was, I was, I had chills myself when I was writing that scene. And I also had to absolutely the worst thing that you could say to a self-absorbed young woman <laughs> and the best, um, because it, it shattered her in a way that she needed to be shattered. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I would, that's the one scene, the movie, the, the movie rights have been sold for the book. And that's the oh, one wow. scene that I'm, hoping will be in the movie and that I am hoping a great older actress will deliver to yeah. a great young actress because I would, oh, wow. just want to see that takedown happen. <laughs> Are you going to write the screenplay? Are you involved with it? No, I'm not. I don't know how to write a screenplay and I'm not mm -hmm. interested in it. Um, and I think that they're not interested in me being interested in it. Um, <laughs> I think that, that the best, my experience with Hollywood has been that the very, if you're lucky enough to have any interaction with them, um, the very best thing to do is to politely take your check and be grateful for it. Um, who I can see already have loads of questions. It's just a very basic last question for me, which is, are you working on something now? A little bit. Um, there's, I'm, I'm at the teeny weeny beginnings of envisioning something, um, but it's mm -hmm. so embryonic at this point. And one thought that I had is that if, if the quarantine goes on and it looks like it's going to for at least another month, um, you know, I've, I've alphabetized my spice rack. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've cleaned out the bathrooms. I've cleaned out the closets. I'm running out of things that I can do that are not writing. And um, so it just may be that from the sheer force of the fact that there's nothing else to do, I might get to work on this thing a little bit sooner than I had expected to. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got a little something brewing, but it's, it's too soon to talk about because it's one of those things where there's a fear that if you just talk about it, it'll crush it. Um, yeah, I know. Or should I just keep going? I think I just keep going, but if if anyone could let me know if it's actually working for them, because I'm only hearing from the people who are saying it's freezing. But let me see if I can find questions. So someone, there's been a couple of questions about from for Liz, how to seize the day. I know that that's how this event was pitched mm -hmm. in some places. So um, let let's get to that. So Liz, how do you seize the day? Okay, so it's a general philosophy. It's a general way of living. Um, more than it is a specific action. And the general way of living is, I believe that this planet, I call it Earth, right? Um, and I believe it's a, it's a school for souls and it's where souls come to advance. And it's a really hard school. <laughs> it's a really, really, really hard school. And um, my friend Martha Beck has this great version of her, her interpretation of that, which is that, that just before a baby is, is about to be born, all the angels gather around the baby and they say, oh my God, you're about to be born and you are going to suffer so much. <laughs> oh my God, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. There's going to be so much pain. There's going to be so much shame. There's going to be so much loss. You're going to have so many opportunities to grow through your pain and your suffering and your loss. We're so excited for you. And the, the soul just goes, wait, wait a minute. But there's going to be good stuff too, right? Like love and happiness and success and joy. And the angels go, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. Could be, but like you're definitely going to suffer. You're definitely <laughs> going to suffer. Um, and that's where the good juice is. Like that's where the good stuff is. And and so what I would say right now in terms of this particular moment in time is that instead of using the language of this is a disaster, this is a catastrophe, this is a, a war, this is the world is crazy right now. Um, I actually don't think that the world is crazy right now. Um, I think that the world itself is doing what the world does. It's doing the job of the world, which is by all appearances and by all history, we've learned the job of the world is to constantly change, mm. to never, ever, ever stop changing. And to sometimes do that very violently and very radically and sometimes do it more subtly, but to never, ever stop. So the world is just doing what the world does. The world is not crazy. I actually don't even think that humanity is that crazy right now. What I'm seeing is a lot of sanity, a lot of people, and by sanity, I mean people in service to one another, people mm -hmm. making sacrifices, um, people doing the right thing, people trying to help each other. This is 
I would argue that this is a rather sane moment. Um, and, and if you want to seize it in terms of an opportunity for your own growth, I can only offer you what I'm doing for myself. I'm not wasting this chance to find out what it's like to be completely alone, to be in isolation, to have all my pacifiers. Um, what do you, you don't call them that in England. What do you call the thing? You dummies. Say the dummies. Yeah. We've all had all the dummies pulled out of our mouths, right? <laughs> Everything that we could ever reach for that yeah. would be comfort, um, that would get us to not have to think about our, our own selves or be in our own minds have been ripped out. To me, that's really interesting. Mm. Um, that's a really interesting moment. And, and if you can replace the words disastrous, crazy, catac cataclysmic, nightmarish with interesting, um, that's the beginning of seizing the day because that's how you regard it with curiosity. Um, don't be in such a hurry to rush through the circumstances of life that have the greatest opportunity of transforming you. Everybody is desperate to have the world go back to what it used to be. That's all I'm hearing is that everybody's like, when can it be back? When is it going to be back? When are we going to have it back? Okay, so mm. first of all, all I remember is all of you all doing nothing but complaining about it when you had it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like, I just want to call you out on that. It's not like I remember a lot of you walking around being like, I'm living in a golden age, you know? Yeah, like, right. You know, you were you had nothing but complaints about it. Now you want it back. That's also very human. Um, so just keep aware of that. And, and maybe you want to start thinking about cultivating a different sort of attitude going forward in your life of gratitude and appreciation for what you've got. That's a way to seize the day. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but mostly I would say seize it by, I'm calling this one in my life, for me, a freebie from God, where it's like, we're going to give you two months. I used to pay to do this. I used to. <laughs> I did. I used to pay to go True. to fucking retreats. You know, I would pay money out of my earnings to go away and be in isolation and in order to learn how to deal with myself. And I heard many people over the years say how much they envied me that I got to do that. Well, now everyone gets to do it. Right. And let me tell you that what it felt like to be in an ashram in India for four months and to be sitting in a meditation cave for eight hours a day in meditation is what this feels like. Mm. irritating, agitating, your sorrow comes up, your rage comes up, your impatience, your frustration. That's what it's like. It's not a spa holiday, yeah. you know, um, but I would just suggest if you really want to make the most of this, don't be in such a hurry to get on a million Zoom parties with people to, yeah. to try to replicate inside of this very special space that we're in, to try to replicate normal life. Mm. Um, don't waste it. Um, Find silence in yourself and see what it feels like to be still and start the really interesting job of making friends with the person who you've been running away from your entire life, which is, of course, you. Yeah. Um, I think that's the most interesting way you can possibly live your life and the most interesting way you can live out this quarantine. Mm -mm -mm. Now, Lauren here says, I'm really struggling with motivation during isolation and also in general. I spend my days staring at walls. We've all been there, Lauren, believe me. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a tip for snapping out of it and finding the importance and urgency in creating? I think maybe importance and urgency are the words that are causing you to shut down. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you might be giving it too much importance and too much urgency, and that's making you anxious. Um, if somebody told me that it was urgent that I create, I think I would stare at a wall too. <laughs> and if somebody told me that what I had to create had to be important, I think that I would also just shut down and be in a, in a case of paralysis. Those, those are really intense words that speak to really high expectations. I would advise and counsel for a softer relationship with it and for lowering your expectations of what it is that you're meant to be creating. Um, I would also say, this is one thing, I, and I don't know whether this is the situation that she's having, but um, a couple people have said to me, I'm having trouble creating because I'm in so much isolation and solitude. One of the things that, I, that I'm wondering when I hear that is whether in fact that's true, or if the fact is quite the opposite, that you've brought too much of the world into the room with you. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you're watching the news for four or five hours a day, or staring at your phone, reading the latest developments of every single twist and turn of what's happening with COVID-19, you're actually not in isolation. What you've done is you've brought a disaster into your home with you that's mm. going to cause you trauma 
and it's going to cause you distress and that is the opposite of creating a creative space that's going to be nurturing and soft and welcoming um you're you're going to traumatize yourself so i would suggest a quarantine on the news um and and a quarantine i i mean i doubt that for most of us watching four or five hours of the news is going to change the virus yep, um, um right. or going to save the world it's not we if we trick ourselves into thinking that we're being responsible citizens by staying in touch it's not actually responsible um, mm -hmm. because you're hurt, you're hurting yourself with that humans are not made to to be able to absorb that much trauma um and that many images and that many stories without actually hurting yourself so i would stop that and i would start to try to figure out what what can you bring into that space with you that's actually nourishing mm. that's encouraging that that you know remember that your creativity is like this very tiny delicate seed right and if you're and if you're poisoning it with toxics toxic news and toxic anxiety it's not it's not going to grow um i would also suggest setting a timer one mm. of the things that people when they're when they're faced with too much room too much space um and a lot of, of us right now in quarantine and isolation have too much room and too much space those hours can seem very daunting in terms of how to fill them. I would just say, take your phone, and once you've turned off all the news apps, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, take your phone and set it for an hour and give yourself one hour a day that you're gonna to devote to doing whatever the creative thing is that you wanna do. The internet has to be off um, and set it up a little bit beforehand, You know, clean off your desk, like make it a really nice space. And when that timer goes off at the end of that hour, you are finished, you are finished walk away even if you're in the middle of a painting if you're in the middle of a poem walk away and the rest of your day is yours to stare at the wall to do whatever you're going to do and then the next day come back for one hour so break it up into reasonable small chunks mm. rather than looking at this as this vast time when you think you're supposed yeah. to be creating always i don't i don't ask myself to do anything creative for more than an hour at a time um, mm -hmm. because otherwise I get overwhelmed and, and it all falls apart. So that's the best advice that I can give you for now. Oh, and also, you know, ask somebody to hold you accountable. Um, mm -hmm. if, you've got, if you've got a friend who is in the same situation, make a deal with them and say, we're gonna do a creativity week. We're gonna check in with each other at the end of the day. We're gonna share our work. Holding each other accountable is a really beautiful way to, um, to, to proceed in times like this too. I also remember in Big Magic, you have this section when you say, you know, if you're expecting to earn lots of money from your book for your creativity to bring money, you're basically yeah. scaring it away. It's like scaring away a cat. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget, really. They, they all want to make the big successful novel or the big successful screenplay. And it's really valuable to know you can't have that kind of <laughs> pressure on yourself or you'll never be able to write anything. Yeah. And, and you can't have it at any level of your career. Like I still can't have that kind of pressure on myself. Mm, mm. Um, I still don't know when I sit down, whether I can do it, you know, what I'm going to do, what it's going to become. You asked me if I was working on something new and I'll share with you that I, I actually wrote a book this year already, Wow! wow. Um, but it's very small. I wrote this little novella. Um, and I haven't shared about this yet, but I, I, I wrote a book that's based on Rhea and oh. it's something that I was working on last year and it's something I worked on at the beginning of the year. I wrote it with every intention of publishing it and then after sitting with it for a few weeks, decided that it's not for the world and, um, and mm -hmm. it's not to be. So if my expectation going in is that I have to write a best-selling book um, or I have to write a book that, you know, I wrote a very strange book that I needed to write for my own heart, but that nobody mm -hmm. needs to read. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know when I was writing it that it was just for me. I assumed that I would publish it, but you have to be willing to allow the work itself to tell you what it wants to be. I really believe that. And this particular thing that I wrote earlier this year has let me know that its work is over, um, mm -hmm. that it was something that it, it and I needed to do for my own purposes and that it doesn't want to be read by anybody else. And I'm like, cool, who am I to argue? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I'll do something else. You know, um, so you have to be willing to, you have to hold it with a light hand to be willing to let it come in. You have to be willing to let it go. You have to have ideas that turn out well, ideas that don't turn out well. Um, and, and as much as you can possibly have, have mercy for it. The other thing, just on the economic front, Mm. Of trying to earn money from your creativity. There's nothing wrong with trying to earn money from your creativity, um, as long as it doesn't kill your creativity yeah. and, and smother it and, and put way too much pressure on it. And just keep this in mind, you guys. Um, 
human creativity and artistic expression, according to anthropologists, is approximately 100,000 years older than human economics. It's 100,000 years older than agriculture. It's old. It's one of our oldest impulses. It predates all of this. It's ancient. It's a deep. We have a deep intuitive relationship with it that has nothing to do with the marketplace. Mm. Long, long before art was a commodity, it was sacred. Um, you know, our artistic expression was a way of communicating with the gods. You know, that's that's what it was. And it was it was sacred. It was celebratory. It was decorative. Um, so if you can remember that, that its original purpose. So when you yell at art and say, I need my art to make money. It, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It yeah. doesn't know what any of this stuff is that's going on. So, um, and, and also, I've said this before too, but if you're a creative person who does make money from your creativity, remember that your creativity before you made money from it was probably your first medicine. Um, the drawings and the writing and the play and the, mm. the designing that you did as a child, you probably did those things intuitively as a child in order to calm your own anxiety. And it became your medicinal, the place that you went to feel safe mm. and the place that you went to, to be able to get out of your own mind. I know that for me, creativity was always a place that I went to feel safe and to be mm. able to get away from my own extreme anxiety that I had as a child. Um, if once it becomes a commodity, the medicine, the medicinal quality of it can be diminished. Yeah. And in that case, I would just suggest that you pick up a secondary creative outlet that has nothing to do with the marketplace. So start drawing, start singing, start gardening, do something else that's creative and generative that you're not trying to sell so that you can replace that feeling of having a sanctuary that's just for you. So what's your creative sanctuary then, Liz? Because obviously your creativity has made you money. And for all that we talk about, oh, shame, you know, realizing people aren't looking at you. They are looking at you when you have a book come out. You know, how do you get away from that sense of other people's expectations or every book must be a huge hit and I've got to top the next one? I mean, I want you to know that I still have that. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, I just have to work with it. You know, um, I think that I have to, what I have to do is be kind to Liz when she loses her sanity um, by thinking that she has to be something, right? And mm -hmm. I do, and I do, I lose my sanity and I think I have to be something. And then I like slowly remember that I don't. Um, so, so it's a gentleness that I have to show toward myself in order to be able to, to handle that. But I've been doing a lot of visual art lately. I've been doing a lot of painting. I'm not, I, I, I'm, I have these journals that I write in. I've shared some pictures of them on Instagram yeah. to encourage people. Um, I love to share pictures of my art just to encourage people to do stuff they aren't good at. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and to be like, look, you, you're allowed to draw. You're allowed to draw even if you draw like you're 11 years old. You're allowed to paint. You're allowed to um, write poetry even if it's not very good. So for me, it's uh, the, the art that I create in, in my journal space is, is probably where I can really quiet myself down the same way I used to be able to when I was 10. Now, we have a lot of messages from people saying how much they, you've inspired them over the years. And this one I thought I'd read out. Um, I won't give the name. I'm, well, it's not private, so maybe so. From Amola saying, oh, no, sorry, that is the wrong message. Saying from Susie J saying, um, oh, no, no, sorry, that's also the wrong name. But there's other messages. Yes, so someone here is saying that she's finishing her book soon. Um, the shameful, uh, so she's finishing her book soon about termination for medical reasons and healing through creativity. Mm -hmm. And her hope is that it it will help someone and Liz you encouraged me to write this so thank Aww. you so much um, and other messages um, I've lost the name I'm afraid I was just looking for it, but someone saying that uh, eating eat pray love uh, gave them the push they needed to leave their partner and they've been with their new she is not able to shut off from what is happening in the real world I treat clients from home so the situation is coming into my home every day how would you suggest um because I'm not in the situation that you're in and most of us are not in the situation that you're in. So the very first thing that I wanna say is thank you for the sacrifices that you're making and the work that you're doing. And again, I'm just hearing the word mercy in my head in terms of finding mercy for yourself for the fact that you might not be able to create a soft, gentle, nourishing environment in your home right now, that you are at the front of the greatest pandemic the world has ever seen. These are not usual days. Um, and if you can maybe just remember that this will end and that when it ends, 
you'll be able to have more space and more light and more grace for yourself. Um, but I think I'm, I'm just afraid that if you set yourself up, like I hate to see people set themselves up. So if you set yourself up with some idea that you should be, if there's any should in there, you know, that you should be able to both be on the front lines of this massive virus as a healthcare worker mm. in holding people's trauma, holding people's pain, helping people in emergency and being creative and nourishing and loving. It's a little bit like what I, well, I was saying this to you the other day too, like a little bit the way I feel about anybody who's at home with small children. I always want to make a, a caveat that says, if you're at home with small children, don't listen to anything that I'm saying. <laughs> you know, just survive, just survive, like just survive. That's all you have to do. Like you don't have to meditate. You don't have to write books. You I wish I could meditate. Like, God, if only, right? Like, and, and, and so mostly what I just want to say to you is I'm so sorry for how hard it is. And I'm so sorry for how unfairly the trauma is being distributed where some people like me aren't getting any of it mm -hmm. and other people like you are getting all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just want to, I just want to wrap you up in love and gratitude more than I want to tell you what to do. Um, we have another message. I keep losing the names. They go so quickly. We're getting so many messages, but a message here from someone I saw earlier, which I really liked, which was, ah, oh, yes, here we go. What would Liz say to someone that had a huge argument with a flatmate that was that, and they were struggling with this because of the lockdown? And I'm sure oh, there are lots of people living with people that are struggling with fighting oh, in the lockdown. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to tell a story. When I was in India, I think I put this in committed or you pray love, I can't remember. But when I was in India, I made friends with this monk who I loved so much. And and he and I just became very close. And we used to, he's an older gentleman, we used to take walks in the garden together in the ashram. And I was very heartbroken about my divorce and very heartbroken about um, my relationship with David and how it had all blown up. And I was so, and I was constantly asking him for, for advice about what to do about these relationships that I was in. And I just remember one day I said, you know, please tell me what I should do about my ex-boyfriend and tell me what I should do about my ex-husband. And he was wearing this long, beautiful orange, you know, monk's robes. And he said, I'm, I'm going to try to answer you, but first let me do this. And he picked up the hem of his robes and he kissed them. And then he put them back down on the ground. And I said, oh, is that like a, a spiritual ceremonial thing? He said, no, I'm just thanking God that I'm a celibate nun and I, or a celibate monk. I'm just thanking God that I'm a celibate monk and I don't have to deal with shit like this anymore. <laughs> so when you said your question about fighting with your flatmates, I just had this thought of like, okay, first I'm just thanking God that I'm yeah. not locked in with anybody right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I know I keep coming back to this word mercy and it's, it's such an important word it's okay. <laughs> of course you had a massive fight with your flatmate. Who wouldn't? Mm. Like, who would be able to go through something like this without that? And it sounds like maybe you've been having problems with this person already anyway, and now you're trapped with them. Ah, uh, take care of the one who is suffering. The one who is suffering is you. Um, the one who is suffering is you. What is? What does she or he need right now? Um, that it, that can be offered. If you were going to be the most loving, best, kindest, most forgiving, compassionate friend to yourself, what would you offer yourself right now that would be soothing? And it might be that you can't make that relationship work. There are a lot of relationships that just cannot be made to work. Mm -hmm. That's tremendous pain. That's going to put you into pain. What do you need? What do you need to get through that pain? Do you need a bath? Do you need some chocolate? Do you need a large glass of water? Do you need to go out for a walk at night if you're allowed out? Like what, what's it going to take to take care of you? So start the triage of emotional drama and trauma has to begin with you taking care of the patient who's right in front of you, which is yourself. Um, and I can't answer for you what, what that would be that you would need. I can only give you permission to have that be the question. Mm. Um, and, and how can you be of service to that person who's, who's truly suffering? And that is mm. you. And, and why wouldn't you be, why wouldn't you be suffering in these circumstances? It's so much mercy has to be shown in that. Um, and I don't think you have to be Gandhi and you don't have to be Mandela and you don't <laughs> have to be, you don't have to be some perfected human who can, 
who can make who can make up with anybody and bring peace to every situation. You just have to take care of the soft animal body that is yourself, as um, as Mary Oliver would teach. <laughs> well, some uh, I'm, I hope I'm not mispronouncing this name. I think it's Adil or Edel. Um, says, and uh, I think this is a good question because we're talking so much about mercy right now. Um, I'd love to hear if Liz has an image or metaphor for mercy that I can keep in my mind. Mm. Oh, boy. Can I tell you how much time do we have? <laughs> we have five minutes. <laughs> so we can stay a bit you, longer. That's fine. I'm going to tell a five-minute story. I'm going to answer your, your question with a story. So when Rhea was sick and dying, I was her caregiver. And um, the thing that I loved most about Rhea was that she was so forgiving of people. And she was really tough and she was really badass and she was really fierce and she had immaculate boundaries, but she had this enormous capacity to forgive people because she herself as a recovering addict, as somebody who had been a heroin addict two years earlier mm -hmm. and a thief and a felon and a liar and a cheat and a steal, like everything that goes along with addiction, she had done such bad things in her life. And so she knew what it was to be a person, a good person trapped in bad behavior. She knew what that was. And so she extended mercy to people when they were at their worst. Um, and me, I was always way more judgmental than she was. And I was always trying to get lessons from her on how do you forgive people like that when they're being awful. And she would just say, people can't help it. You know, people can't help the way that like they're human. She would always just talk about embracing her own humanity was how she got sober and embracing other people's humanity was how she got well. And and just allowing people to be what they are in that moment and not judging them. So anyway, I was taking care of her when she was sick and dying. She was in enormous pain and she was on fentanyl. You may have heard of fentanyl because it's part of the opioid crisis that's happening right now, but it's a very powerful um, painkiller. And she had to be on it with patches. You put these patches on that would last 72 hours and that way she wasn't ripping apart her, her stomach lining with so many pills. And right. I was in charge of distributing the patches. And there was this incident that happened where she was in so much pain and she was in so much pain that the patches weren't working. The, and the doctor kept, I kept calling the doctor and he kept telling me to put more on her, which was really dangerous because the more fentanyl in your system, the more likely you might overdose. But she was in three days of the worst pain I've ever seen a human being be in my entire life, um, where it looked like a wounded animal had been hit up by a car on the side of the road, awful. And finally, after three days, a nurse was able to get to our house and see what was going on. And what has had happened is that I had put her patch on incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, so she she hadn't been getting any, any painkillers um, while she was in stage four pancreatic and liver cancer dying. And she just, the, the nurse peeled, and there's this little peel that you have to peel off and I hadn't been doing it. Okay. And I also hadn't been sleeping. I also had been taking care of a, of course, a dying, of I'd also been on my own. But when I saw what I had done and what I had, the pain that I had put her through, I oh, remember goodness. going, oh, it was horrible. And I, mm -hmm. I just ran into the bathroom and locked the door and fell apart completely. I didn't want her to see me, but I couldn't do anything but fall apart. Um, and I just kept saying, I will never forgive myself. I will never, oh, forgive, myself. I will never forgive myself for this. And, and as I lay there, I started thinking about all the people in the world who have done things that they can never forgive themselves for. And whether it's small things or whether it's the doctor who made a slip with the scalpel and somebody could never walk again or somebody who had that like drove with just a little too much alcohol in them and had a fatal accident or dropped the child or did, you know, these, th these awful things that happen to people. And I have a dear friend who's, whose baby died on her watch, you know, as one of these like turn your head and nightmare and I was and I thought about her and I thought about the pain I was in and I thought about the level of pain that this woman must be in and I thought I'm just going to call her Mary that's not her name but I thought do you believe that Mary is deserving of mercy and would you want her to release herself completely of blame and shame and would you want her to be able to lead a peaceful life and I answered yes and then the next question was so if she's deserving of that, aren't, aren't you also? Um, because if you're, if you're not deserving of mercy because you made this mistake, then you're saying that nobody is deserving of mercy for making mistakes. And if you're not deserving of mercy for making a mistake, then Mary isn't either. 
you know, um, so you got to choose either everybody's off the hook <laughs> or no one, right? Which world do you want to live in where everyone is forgiven or no one is forgiven? And you take your pick, you know, and, and in that moment, I realized that if you live in a world where you're not forgivable and there's no mercy for yourself, then you don't need to worry about when people die, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, because that is hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, a world with no mercy, a world where mercy is withheld is hell. That's the definition of hell is the withholding of mercy, whether it's to yourself or to somebody else. And in that moment, I realized that mercy would be the portal that would always be able to keep me connected with Rhea, even after she died. Mm -hmm. Because as I, so what I did laying there on that bathroom floor sobbing, I just took my own hand and I kissed myself and I said, I forgive you, I forgive you. And in that moment, I could feel the way Rhea feels about people when she used to see them at their worst. And she was able to say, I forgive you, I forgive you. So the image that I use is me on the bathroom floor kissing my own hand <laughs> mm -hmm. and saying i want to let you off the hook from this because if because i don't want to live in a, in a in a hell world where no one is allowed mercy for their mistakes and and if i'm going to want mary and everybody else who's who's suffering to be free then i have to free myself as well mm -hmm. well i think that is all we sadly have time for tonight i can't imagine going any deeper than we have. I feel that's the perfect place to end. Liz, I could talk to you, listen to you for days and days. I wish I was isolated with you. I feel like you oh, have so awesome. much wisdom. This has been an amazing hour um, for me. And I can see from the comments, other people feel the same. Um, I think we've all taken an enormous amount of this. So Liz, thank you so much for taking the time for your beautiful books and for this amazing talk. This has been incredible. I'm sending you love and healing energy and I hope that you don't have COVID-19 and I hope that you, if you do, that it's light and I hope that you survive being home with your three kids under the age of five. <laughs> you're doing right now, the fact that you took time from this to be with me and with us is extraordinary and I'm grateful for it. And and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to see all the faces individually of everybody out there, but um, be merciful to yourselves <laughs> and this will pass and um and it's all going to be all right <laughs> thank you thank you liz and thank you all of you for coming We're, it's going to be good night from both of us now so thanks to everyone out there good night night